So I have the pleasure of, of getting you just after the lunch break. So thanks very much for, um, for choosing to come to this session. And I uh, hope I can, uh, I can wake you up after all that great food you've been, uh, been eating at lunchtime. But at least the lunch breaks are quite long. So chances are you ate sort of like 45 minutes ago, perhaps even an hour and a bit ago. So you've got sort of past that post-lunch uh, session and you'll be uh, ready for some action. And my name is Brian Smith. I'm an escalation engineer in the support team for Microsoft Project. Uh, I've been working in the support group for uh, probably coming up 10 years this year. So I worked on the uh, 2002, 2003, 2007, 2010, 2013, and Project Online releases. Uh, before joining the support group, I worked for a solution group uh, developing sort of small applications that, that ran on top of uh, Project Server. Uh, one of those was a, a Six Sigma accelerator for Project Server 2002, uh, and that was also revised for 2003. If you ever use those applications, um, you have my apologies. Um, they were great applications, but didn't sort of um, work too well when you patched the server and went up to SP1 and all those kind of things. So uh, that's a long way behind me now. Um, I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon about managing projects just got easier with Microsoft Project Pro for Office 365. As I mentioned, I'm a support guy and not a marketing guy. I probably wouldn't have said that managing projects can ever get easier. It's always hard work, and the tool is, I guess, the easy bit of it. The really hard bit with project management has nothing to do really with the technology and the applications and everything else. It's all the other stuff you have to do to make stuff happen. So you know, potentially, um, Project Pro for Office 365 can help with the other stuff, uh, whether it makes, easy, makes it easier or not. Well, hopefully it makes it easier. It certainly doesn't make it easy. Um, I'll also mention here what is Microsoft Project Pro for Office 365, because it might be a term that uh, some of you haven't heard before. It's basically Microsoft Project Professional 2013, but just delivered via subscription model and automatically patched for you. So it will sort of receive updates. It'll be downloaded via click to run when you first sign up. Um, and it will be updated as you go along, so you don't have to worry about it. But in terms of what it looks like, what it does, you wouldn't be able to spot the difference between that and Project Professional 2013 very easily unless you started sort of looking behind on the file menu and see how your updates are delivered and all that kind of thing. So it is basically the um, Project Professional 2013 delivered via subscription. It can be used just as you'd used Project Standard or Project Professional. You can just use it as a desktop tool. You don't have to be using it with Project Online. So you know, it, it may be a, an easier way for you to purchase Project Professional to get the Project Pro for Office 365 version rather than sort of getting the, the normal sort of, if you like, packaged software version to, to sort of put it a different way. Uh, a quick poll of who I've got in the room. Uh, I guess it, as we're at TechEd, most of you are sort of IT pro. Is that a fair assumption? No IT pros. That, that is a surprise. Um, so how many of you actually manage projects? How many would actually call yourself a project manager? OK, that's good. How many of you manage sort of portfolios of projects compared to sort of desktop? OK, that's good. That's good. Right. And what I'm going to be talking about today, well, firstly, I'll talk about the, the, the sessions uh, how many were at yesterday's session that I did? Okay, there's a few of you. There will be a, a little bit of repetition, but even the bits that are very similar to the things I did yesterday, I'm going to try and do them in a different way and show you some slightly different things. So hopefully it should be sort of valuable for, for people who were at yesterday's session anyway. Not too much overlap. Um, so hopefully you, the ones that weren't at yesterday's can watch the recording of that one. And then the, gen, the agenda for today, I'm just going to talk briefly about these sort of uh, philosophy and vision for project, where we sort of see it going and sort of where it's coming from. Um, then there's going to be some demos and some demos and some more demos. And then at the end, there'll be time for Q&A. So hopefully we can leave questions to the end. If there are any that do crop up, if you could use the microphones, uh, it not only helps with the recording, because everybody can hear what you're saying on the recording, but my hearing's not as good as it was. And I sometimes get it. The, the sort of situation where I start answering the question that I'd like to answer rather than the one that you've asked if I don't hear it properly. So if you, if you use the microphones, you've got a better chance of getting your question answered rather than the one I want to answer. So that helps. 
Um, I shouldn't be doing too many slides. Most of this session will be in, in, uh, spent in demos. And just in case you want to sort of rush out and go to your second choice session, what I plan to sort of cover is talking about uh, SharePoint task lists. So it won't all be spent in Project Pro for Office 365. SharePoint task lists, what you can do with them, what you can't do with them, um, how you can get those into uh, Project Online, how you can open those task lists with Project Professional, uh, some of the restrictions you might run into with running those as task lists. Uh, then sort of moving up to um, sort of more in-depth on Project Pro for Office 365, looking at some of the new features around uh, Team Planner, Task Paths, uh, a lot on the reporting, digging into some of those things, uh, the timeline, um, publishing those projects to Project Online, so um, making those sort of true enterprise projects rather than just sort of a, a local MPP or a, a SharePoint task list project. Um, and then sort of talking about the differences between all of those different aspects and where you might want to use one and where you might want to use another. Um, so hopefully that will give you a sort of good insight to what Project Pro for Office 365 is, both in terms of a, a standalone application, something that you might connect to SharePoint, something that you might connect to Project Online, and how that all sort of hangs together. So not too many people got up and ran away, so um, that, that's good, that's good. Hopefully you've come to the right room. So philosophy and vision um, for, for Microsoft Project, what we're looking at doing is delivering a comprehensive set of tools so that you can use sort of almost any device through the cloud or on-premises. So today for Project, and we, we don't have the sort of native iPad app for Microsoft Project Professional, um, you can actually run Project Professional in a lot of the emulation software that you might run on a, an Apple Mac, for instance. So we do sort of play in that environment. But we do support all the browsers. So if you're using a, um, any of the phones, the browsers on the phones will work. We've also got a good uh, partner ecosystem. And a lot of them have taken our APIs and then built applications to run on the various different phone systems, uh, whether that's Android, iPhone, or, or Windows Phone so that it can interact with projects. So you might be able to do your timesheet on an iPhone, for instance, and then the updates will go through to Project Server, Project Online, and then the project manager can sort of accept those in. But I mean, today there isn't a sort of replacement for Project Professional, the sort of PC desktop. Um, and another point I just wanted to clarify here, uh, who's heard of Project Online? Just a quick. OK, so uh, quite a few of you heard of Project Online. Uh, I won't ask you what you think it is, because it might upset me to think that you think it's something that it isn't. The, the naming has confused quite a few people that they think, oh, I use Project, I use Microsoft Project. Here's an online version, I'll go and buy that. And then they get it and realize that it isn't actually Microsoft Project in an online form. It's really sort of Project Server served via uh, the cloud. So we perhaps should have called it Project Server Online, but then we don't call it Exchange online, exchange server online. So the server bit got dropped, but it gets very confusing for project because we've got a desktop application called project. Obviously, for exchange, there isn't a desktop application called exchange. It's called Outlook, so there's no confusion there. Um, so I've seen quite a few people that sort of sign up for project online and think, mm, this isn't what I was expecting. So if you're sort of expecting the desktop version of project, then Project Pro for Office 365 is, is that replacement, and there isn't a a pure web form of project um, professional as such. You can do a lot of editing of projects in the browser. So if you're working on a, a reasonably small project and you're not having to do uh, sort of heavy things like sort of baselining and leveling and all of those things that you'd normally do in the client, then it's fine. If you just wanted to sort of put a project plan together of sort of 20, 30 tasks and assign some resources and and put the sort of schedule together so it's in indentations and so on, then no problem. You can use the web version sort of wherever you are, and that's great. But if you want to do some of the sort of normal the heavy lifting type of things that you might do with, uh, with Project Professional, then the, the rich desktop client is still really the place you, you want to be. So just wanted to sort of set the scene on, on uh, sort of what Project Online is and what Project Online isn't. So I'll be referring to it later on during the sort of demos in terms of how it connects to the server or how the client connects to Project Online. So the one thing that we're, we're looking at doing as we move forward, and some of this has sort of happened over the last couple of releases of sort of 2010 and 2013, 
Um, I mean, typically, a lot of people are managing tasks in things other than project. They're using Outlook. They might be using Excel. Uh, Excel is probably still our biggest competitor for project in terms of where people are managing projects or managing tasks. Um, so you know, how, do we, how do we get people sort of to move into the project environment? And, and one way of doing that is moving them up through SharePoint online. So instead of using Excel for your list of tasks, stick them in a list in SharePoint. And you can still then um, see your list OK. You can even export it to Excel if you wanted to. But the other advantage you get is some of the collaboration opportunities that SharePoint gives you. So SharePoint knows all your users. So you can go in and use the people picker to assign a task to, to Brian Smith, for instance. And then that person can see that task on their task page if they go to their My Site. And they can update it and say, yep, I finished that one. And that information will be fed back to you. So you, know, you can move up from sort of Excel Outlook onto SharePoint Online and start using the, the, the rich client of Project Pro for Office 365. And once you get to the point where you're using fairly complex projects, or perhaps even um, portfolios, or uh, perhaps master projects and inserted projects, which will work far better in the client, then you can sort of move up to Project Online and use that along with Project Pro for Office 365 as the sort of client end uh, to be able to manage your full set of programs. And the session I did yesterday, we spent quite a bit of time in the sort of portfolio management, which I think is one of the good strong features of Project Online. Being able to define what your business is about. What, what are your drivers? What are, you, what are you in business for? And then making sure that the projects that you're planning to do align with those drivers. So working out you know, what are the most important drivers, which projects are we doing, which ones align with those drivers, and, and working out OK, th these are the projects that we really should be executing on. Uh, these ones seemed like a good idea at the time, but that's not really what we're in business for. Um, so now watch the recording of, uh, of yesterday's session if you're into the, the portfolio end of the, the project management. So switching over to the demo. And I usually get the timing here just wrong. Oh, it's good today. Usually I just switch over just as it sort of screen locker comes on and I have to sort of go back into the, the application again. Um, so here I've got Project Online. So this is running uh, in the cloud. Uh, this is sort of, if you're familiar with Project Server, how many people have used Project Server in any of its incarnations? OK, good few there. So you'll probably be reasonably familiar with this. Um, one of the benefits of the subscription model, Project Pro for Office 365 and Project Online, is we can patch it uh, pretty quickly and fairly frequently. So some of the things that we've changed, for instance, we fairly early on realized that we were attracting a, a, a new type of customer with Project Online. Perhaps the smaller teams that had never considered uh, Project Server because of the infrastructure and the servers and SharePoint and SQL and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the opportunity to sort of get into Project Online at a, a reasonably low price point was attracting those sort of smaller companies. And the problem that uh, they were running into was they were sort of faced with this, but didn't really know what it was and how to do anything with it. So we actually changed some of the, the layout of the screen. Um, we found that people weren't finding where to download Project Pro for Office 365 if they purchased that. So we put the link right there. Uh, if you're new to Project Online, learn how to get started, which takes you off to a set of videos and other sort of tech net content, which talks about, OK, how do, I, how do I get my resources into this system? How do I get projects in? Uh, I can bring them in from task lists. Uh, I can bring them in if I've already been using Project from MPPs. So it sort of walks you through the sort of getting started process. Uh, so they're things that we just added as we realized that they were things that people were struggling with. So a lot of sort of usability things that hadn't really been an issue with Project Server, because it's normally something that um, a lot more planning would have gone into it in terms of the infrastructure and justification for using it. So by the time you got it, you knew what it was going to do. Whereas you know, if you've just got to get your credit card out and spend you know, $33, then you're faced with this, and it, it can be a bit daunting. So I'm going to start in terms of the task management in our favorite competitor. Uh, which is Excel. And I'm going to take a, um, this task list, and I'm going to put it into a, 
into a task list on my site. So I'm just going to go back into here, and I'm going to add an app. And I'm going to add a task list. I'm going to give it a name, TE, use the right keyboard. Twenty fourteen and create that. And then once I've got that task list, I can go in and edit the list, get my tasks back to the list and Use the right keyboard, paste that in. You know, go through and put all my tasks in, but it's also going through and validating the resources. So it's matching them up to people that it knows exist within my SharePoint environment. At the same time, what it's done, you can see that the first one is on us. That's a new addition we did to Project Online because we realized that people didn't understand the relationship between the tasks and the timeline at the top. So what we did was we put the first one on there so you can see, okay, I've got this task, phase one strategic plan, and it's, it stuck it up there on the task list for me. So it helps to sort of understand how the, the timeline works and how to sort of get tasks up there and, uh, uh, and not. Now, obviously, this doesn't look quite like it did in Excel uh, in that Excel just had a few spaces to make it look like they were different phases and so on. Um, so we can sort of tidy up in here. So if I get some of these tasks. I can go up to my list options, sorry my, oops, sorry, my task options, and I can indent. So I can get it to look sort of more like a project plan, and then I know that I've got a few of these that I need to change again, so I'm just going to indent some more of these. And we can get it looking more like the project plan was meant to look like, how we'd sort of formatted it in, in Excel. We can also edit these individual items. So if we want to sort of go in and, and edit the, the individual task, we can open them up um, so that we can add other dates, for instance. So this phase one strategic plan, in Excel, it was just held there with the due date. So this is when we need to finish this phase. And obviously we might want to sort of put a duration on that as well. So I'm just going to uh, stop editing the list as a list, go in and just open this particular task. Edit that and say that's going to start today. I'll save that one. So now we've uh, changed that, it obviously takes up all of the timeline, and then we might want to put some of our other things on the timeline as well, so we can do that directly from here. And say, okay, there's our decision on whether to proceed or not, and it's using the due date for that, so that's why it sort of jumped sort of uh, back there, and I can add this one in June as well to the timeline. So that's sort of okay for sort of basic plans. Now obviously any of my resources that I've assigned to this plan um, can see these tasks as well. So they'll come up on their sort of my task list. And I'm, I'm not, I probably won't see any of these tasks just yet. But if I go to my tasks, because there's a synchronization that happens sort of between um, the, the complete list of my tasks and all the others. So I'm probably not going to see those ones I've just added. But this sort of gives you the idea that I can see tasks from different projects as well as personal tasks showing up in here. And this is just the tasks link from, from my site. I've probably lost a few tasks there because I've been playing around and adding tasks and deleting them. So it's, uh, it's probably taken away the ones that I've deleted since I last refreshed this page. So that's the very sort of basic look at a task list, but it's not very uh, exciting. So let's see how we can sort of take that up a stage. I'm going to switch over to Project Pro for Office 365 now, and then show you how that can integrate with a task list as well. 
But first off, I'm going to show you some of the new features that are, that are in project in the 2013 release. So here we've got a, uh, an in-progress project plan. Um, it's sort of more or less up to date. So it's complete up till sort of this week sometime, mostly. We've seen the resources assigned here. We're also seeing that some of the resources, the, the, the link presence is working as well. Because so I've actually got uh, Sarah Davis logged in to link in this particular environment, if I bring that up. So I can sort of see that Sarah's online, so I could see that directly from within my project plan. So if I needed to ask her about something she's doing on the project, I can see whether she's online, I can message her, phone or whatever, right without leaving that and having to go off and find link and, and, and do it from there. So it's a great new feature that uh, we've added there, just in terms of the, the presence indicator that we're getting in inside uh, project itself. The other thing we've got um, is a timeline in Project Professional. Now, how many, how many people are using Project 2010? And how many of you use the timeline today? OK. It, it's funny, we, we, I was um, doing a presentation down at um, the PMI Congress in New Orleans, and I was talking to somebody and showing them 2013, and showing them the timeline. And, I said, and they said, yeah, it's a really great feature. And they, they said, well, what version are you using? It's a 2010. I said, well, you've, you've got the timeline. But it never switched it on. And it, I think normally it would come on by default, but if you've sort of upgraded and using your existing global MPT, you probably never see it unless you come onto the view menu and you click timeline there. And it will bring up the timeline as, as another view. If you do use it, though, it, it takes up, if you're used to using project, you'll know that you've got two views on that page. You've got the top view and the bottom view. And the first thing I did when I used a plan with a timeline was try to sort of drag up from the bottom right-hand corner to bring my bottom pane up, and it didn't work. So when you switch on the timeline, it's actually taking the top portion of that view. So if you want the normal sort of split view, you'd normally sort of bring up the bottom, the bottom level there uh, without the timeline turned on to get that sort of view. I'm going to go into the timeline now, and I'm going to add my phases to it. And to do this, I'm going to go to the outline level, and I'm going to hide, oops, I'm going to hide all the subtasks. And then I can take those first four. And there's an option here to add to timeline. So as soon as I do that, it would bring all my phases up onto the timeline. So I can see sort of where those different phases uh, start and finish. So in the same way, I could go back to seeing all of my tasks and then do a filter for my milestones, for example. If I want to add my milestones to the, the timeline, rather, I just highlighted my milestones. What I meant to do was filter my milestones. I wondered why they didn't uh, show up. So you can then sort of choose these and say, OK, I want to add these to my timeline as well, and choose how they appear. And you can do other formatting on here as well. So once you're in the timeline view, it brings up a format option, and you can go in there and change the coloring. Uh, you can change the font. You can change how the callouts display. So normally, it will add the, the milestones as, as callouts on the side, and the phases and things like that, it will put on anything with the duration. It will tend to sort of show within the timeline uh, as a bar. Now, the cool thing with this is that it makes reporting on the project very straightforward. So I can. Uh, go from here and say, OK, copy the timeline for presentation. And if I'm putting together a PowerPoint for my monthly report, I can just come in here and paste. And then I've got my timeline there. And I can just sort of change the, the scale, get it looking how I want. Now, I pasted it as a picture, but it, it, does, it can exist as just word art as well. So for example, if you wanted to sort of change the look and feel once you're in PowerPoint, 
or dare I say change the dates in PowerPoint because you, know, you might not want to be that exact with when things are going to work out. Um, then you can sort of do that. Now, however you paste it into PowerPoint, it is just a snapshot. There's no synchronization between this sort of snapshot and project. If I go back into project and change my dates, this slide isn't going to change miraculously. You'd have to sort of snapshot it again and bring it in. And likewise, if I change any dates on here, they're not going to push back to project either. So going back into project, uh, the next thing I wanted to show you, and I'll just take my, my filter out of there. Um, we changed the reporting quite dramatically in Project Professional 2013. Um, it's probably overdue by at least uh, two or three releases, um, but it's, um, it's amazing how many people miss the old reports as well. But the new reports can be found under the report option here and under various different groupings. So we've got some dashboards, we've got resource-based reports, cost-based reports as well. And if I go into the dashboards and just have a look at uh, a project overview, then it will sort of give me some basic information about the project. So it will tell me in this case that it's a certain percentage complete um, and when some of the milestones are, are due in there as well. So then I could take some of that information and paste it into my, my, uh, my reports too. So you could just sort of copy those as pictures and, and paste them into um, your PowerPoint. So that's the, the, the project overview. Um, if I look at some of the other reports, we can see uh, a work overview. So for example, we can see how, many, how much remaining work we've got, what the work overview is in terms of remaining availability um, for uh, a couple of our resources there. Uh, we can see who's been doing the most work in terms of the actual work and remaining work. And we can see how much work's been done in the various phases there too. Another report that we've had uh, requests for uh, quite a lot are the burndown reports. So here we've got a, a, a couple of burndown reports that we uh, produce sort of out of the box. Um, and all of these reports, if you click on them, you can then go in and change the fields that you're showing as well. So they're not just uh, static out of view of, the, of how the world should be. If you don't like the reports that we put together, it's very easy to go in there and choose different fields that you want to display, uh, choose different ways you want to display them, uh, and then save that information um, so that you can use that report uh, uh, just how you like it. The other thing we've, we've done on here is we've got some descriptions on the bottom of the um, reports telling you what we think they're showing or you know, what we know they're showing. Because another common um, thing we get back is, well, you, you, what is a burndown report? Everybody's got their own definition. So for most of the reports that we put into these report packs, we also put a short definition at the bottom so that you know what it's showing. So if it isn't the same as what you'd normally define a burn-down report to be, then you'll, you'll understand what we're trying to show. And if you want to show something else, obviously you can just come in here, choose different fields, uh, and show those instead to get the, the, the kind of burn-down reports that you're interested in. There's also a report that shows over-allocated resources as well. So I can see in this particular case that uh, both Sarah Davis and Alex Darrow are over-allocated. Some were over-allocated on their actual work, which um, good for them for, for, for doing that. But obviously, there's quite a bit of remaining work that they appear to be over-allocated for as well. So I'm going to come back to the Gantt chart and just look at a couple of other features that help us deal with over-allocations. And if I scroll down the plan, we should see that Alex Darrow and Sarah Davis have this red figure on the left-hand side. What I recently learned was called Rog. He's the red over-allocated guy, apparently. Um, so whenever you see that showing up, it means there's an over-allocation of that particular resource. So obviously, there's plenty of different ways you can sort of deal with an over-allocation. Um, one of those is to go to the task inspector 
and you can sort of inspect the task and it will tell you a little bit about that task and sort of what's going on and the actions that you could take to resolve that problem. So at the moment it's saying the resources are over, over allocated due to work on other tasks. So it gives me some actions. I can either move the task, I can view over allocated resources in the team planner, and then it gives me a little bit of information about that task as well. So this is, this is just one example of what the task inspector can do. Um, there's other useful things that will help you understand why a task is getting scheduled as it is. Because quite often in support, we'll get questions from customers saying, we've got this project and I've got this task, and it's saying it won't start it till Wednesday, but you know, really I can't see why it isn't starting it at the beginning of the week. The task inspector will tell you what's driving that task. So it could be that there's a, a specific calendar for the resource. So it's not going to start it till Wednesday because that particular resource only works sort of Wednesday to Sunday or something like that. So task inspector is great for finding um, reasons why a project is doing stuff that you perhaps think isn't quite what you're expecting. So I'm actually going to go into the uh, team planner now to show you how we can look at the over allocations from a sort of a different perspective. Again, we get the, the presence information here, so we can see that sort of Sarah's online there. Um, but this is like the Gantt chart, but the other way around. We've got the resources on the left-hand side. I'll just see if this reconnects. Sorry about that. Uh, we've got the resources on the left-hand side, and then we've got the tasks showing on the right-hand side. We've also got a couple of other tasks here that show us unscheduled. So a new feature in 2010 and in 2013 were manually scheduled tasks. So they're basically tasks that are in the project plan but they don't have anything specifically set up for when they're going to happen. Or they have um, dates set up that are manually entered. So think of it more like Excel. You can just put in a task, you can type in the dates, project isn't going to schedule it, it's not going to move it, it's just going to leave it where you placed it in that, uh, in that particular task. And I'll show you a little bit more about manually scheduled tasks when we get uh, past this uh, scheduling problem. So I can look at Sarah Davis. If I scroll over to the right, I can see what's causing the problem here. She's got two tasks happening at the same time. Now right within the team planner, I can take one of those tasks and move it to unallocate Sarah Davis. Now you may or may not want to do that. What's happening behind the scenes because I'm using the team planner is it's creating a constraint on that new task. So you, know, you may not want to work with constraints. You might be better working in the Gantt chart and working out, okay, where, where can Sarah do it? How do I need to delay that so that it fits into the schedule? Um, isn't constrained, because obviously once it's constrained, if something else gets delayed, then that constrained task isn't going to start jumping about. So it, it's a very simple way of sort of seeing the over allocations. You can deal with them in here or you may choose that you want to sort of deal with them in another way. But it's certainly a good sort of visible way of seeing, seeing what's happening. Uh, likewise with Alex, I could sort of move out his over allocation on those items. Um, as you can see, one thing will affect another in here as well. So I, 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 I moved Alex's task, it got constrained and then put a, an over allocation on Katie. So you can sort of see what's sort of happening as you're sort of going along on here. Uh, the other thing you can do is take these unscheduled tasks. Uh, this one's unscheduled, but it's assigned to Katie. So I know Katie needs to do this, so I can just drag that. Oop. I think I dropped it somewhere along the, uh, the way there, so I'll just undo that. So I can drag that and put it where I want that particular task to happen. Um, so it's now both scheduled and assigned to Katie Jordan. And then one down here, train staff, it's neither scheduled or assigned. So again, I can drag that up and say, okay, it looks like uh, Sarah might be able to do that uh, around about May the 18th. So I can, I can schedule it and assign it in one go in the team planner. Oh, 
And we can see sort of where those tasks sort of ended up in terms of the hiring staff and the training staff. And the, the, the mark next to it is like a push pin. And when we were developing this particular feature, we were referring to them as pinned tasks. So that's sort of pinned to a date. They happen at a certain time. And, and you've put that into the system. The system's not going to move that. But the other advantage of these type of tasks, if I add my new task here, by default, my system's set up to create new tasks as manually scheduled. You can change that. I mean, one of the, uh, the common things we find, a lot of people that perhaps weren't that comfortable with using Microsoft Project really love this feature. Um, if they're used to using Excel as their project management tool, it really works well for them. Um, most people who are project managers sort of threw their arms up and thought, you know, I don't like this, take it away. Don't make it uh, sort of do things for me. And, and you can just change it. You can just make sure that auto-scheduled tasks are your default, and then you won't have to use these tasks and, unless you physically choose to use them. Uh, they are my default. And you can see the one that I've just created has a question mark next to it. And the question mark is there because there's no information in here at all. I've got no duration. I've got no start. I've got no finish. You know, if I did say, OK, this is going to be um, a week. And it's going to start on 5, 15, 2014. Then obviously, project's got enough information there to know what the start, the finish, and the duration. So it, it will fill in the gaps when it's got the information. But the other thing you can do in here, if I had yet another task, my new task 2, I can put in here, oh, um, I think I'm going to have to ask Sarah. You know, when this start date is going to be. And then um, this is probably going to be end of July. So you can just type in free text into those fields just as a sort of a reminder as you're putting together the project plan. So you don't actually have to sort of know exactly what the dates are going to be, but you can just sort of put the information in there. And then you can ask Sarah, once she comes back, you can put the real date in. Uh, and you, you could, I mean, you can switch from uh, manually scheduled to automatically scheduled as well. And then obviously the scheduling engine will take over and it will put it whenever it needs to be. Normally as soon as possible, unless you've got some sort of predecessor um, showing up, up there as well. So this is a, a quick run through of the information that's shown, uh, the, the, the new features that we got in Project, Serve, Project Professional 2013 and Project Pro for Office 365. The next thing I'm going to do is show you how that will link into SharePoint. And I'm going to use Save As in this case. And I'm going to create uh, a new SharePoint site for this one. And it's going to be called TechEd Strategic Business Generation. It's going to be created on my uh, PWA site that I'm already using, but it's going to create a new sort of subsite on that. And I can click Save. And this will now be creating a site, putting all those tasks into a task list on that site so that my resources can interact with those. Now, one of the disadvantages is while it's doing that, one of the disadvantages of, of using the SharePoint um, task list for your resource updates is there's no real item level security on it as far as project is concerned. If you're just using it as a task list, it's expecting it to sort of be more or less wide open. So there's nothing stopping me going in, looking at Sarah's task, and saying, OK, that task is now 100% complete. Um, if you're using project, then you can build into uh, the the system a lot more security than that, so you can make sure that only the people who are assigned the tasks are the people who are updating them, or people who should be updating them. So sometimes you might assign a task to an external uh, person. They don't have access to your system, for example. You might have an internal person who is really the, the status owner as far as that particular task is concerned and will be making the updates. So this is just going through now. It's updating SharePoint and Project. And it's coming up with a message there. 
We can't sync resource Molly Dempsey to the task list because the resource does not exist in the SharePoint server. Um, I was expecting that, fortunately. Um, if it had been a different message, then I might not have been smiling. Um, so this resource and any other resource that doesn't exist in SharePoint will remain assigned to the tasks in your project plan. So it's not going to drop them from the plan. Uh, and the plan is actually stored in SharePoint as well. So there, there's a site assets folder within the site. And an MPP copy of this will get saved there. And Molly will still be assigned to that. But because she doesn't exist in SharePoint, there's no way that I can sort of publish a task with Molly's name against it, because it's, it's validating and using the people picker uh, for all that information. So I can say OK to that. And this should then bring up my browser. And here's my, my brand new site, TechEd Strategic Business Generation. Because I'd already formatted the timeline in project, it puts the timeline there for me as well in the website. So that's a new feature for 2013. We had the timeline in the client for 2010. We added it in for Project Server 2013 and Project Online uh, for parity there. Now, one point to note about the timeline, it's like any other view within Project Professional. You can create your own custom timelines. So you might want one timeline that shows the phases and the milestones. You might have another timeline that shows some, um, some key, uh, perhaps critical tasks that you really want to have visibility to. So you create several of these different timelines. The one that will appear on PWA is the default one. So it's the one that appears when you check the timeline box. It'll be the one that appears there. If you've selected a different timeline to display in Project Professional, and then you sort of save it to SharePoint, you won't get that different timeline. You'll get the one that's the default. Just something that sort of can catch people out. So whichever one, uh, whichever sort of style of timeline you want to appear in PWA, or in, in a SharePoint site in this example, um, you use the default one to be the, the one that's going to uh, appear here. So it's brought in our timeline. It's giving us a quick project summary. So we've got two late tasks, 10 upcoming, 19 days. Phase three plan for action is due in 19 days. I can come over to my task list, and very much the same as the small task list we were playing around with at the beginning of the session, I can see the same set of tasks here. So if I scroll down, I can see that we're sort of more or less up to date. All the tasks are, uh, are complete up till, um, till yesterday. But there is one fairly close to the top that wasn't complete for Sarah. And as you can see, I'm signed in as Brian Smith, but there's nothing to stop me completing Sarah's task for her. But if I go back over to project, and I'll scroll back up to the, the top there. So this is the task that didn't look as though it was complete, and it isn't complete in here either, obviously. I can now go back to my save and sync. And this is two-way. So any updates that are done in, um, that's not a good sign. Any updates that are done in SharePoint will reflect back to project. And likewise, any updates that are done in project will go back to, to SharePoint as well. So I'm just going to go back to my task list. That was my backup task list. So I just go my, to my task list that I just created. So I just accepted Sarah. And go to my list. And one feature I wasn't going to show you as part of this demo, but I now will because project just crashed on me, is you can open the task list from, pro um, open this task list with project. And it's asking me to validate. I'm actually signed in as uh, Sarah into Project Professional. Um,
That should now bring in all of those tasks. We should see the, uh, the Sarah one has been marked as, as complete as well. And there it is, it's, it's checked. Uh, you can see the way that operated at that point. It brought it in and it was not checked. So it actually opened the MPP from the site assets folder and then it goes off to the list to see how it needs to synchronize. So it's getting the information from the SharePoint list there as well. But it also gives us the, the message about Molly Dempsey again uh, because she's still not in SharePoint, so it's not going to synchronize her. Okay, so we've now got uh, our SharePoint site. Um, but we're still just a, sh a, a, a list within SharePoint. We're not anything to do with Project Online at this point. But I could decide, I could be using Project Online, and I, I now want to bring this project into Project uh, Online so that I can work on it there as well um, in terms of showing it in the Project Center so I can see it compared to all of my other projects. So one of the options for doing that, if I go back to my uh, PWA site, that one out. And one of the options on here is create or import projects. And if I go into this get started tile, it tells me I can add existing SharePoint sites to Project Web App. And it just so happens I've got a SharePoint site that I want to add. It goes off and it sort of looks through and sees what's available. And the one I want is the one I've just added, the TechEd Strategic Business Generation. So I can add that, and it says now, we're creating your projects. When they're ready, they'll show up in Project Center. So it's an asynchronous job, it's happening in the background. And then I can say, uh, close on that. And very shortly, my project should be available in the Project Center. It probably won't be there yet. It should be there in a few seconds. But just while that's, that's coming up, this, what we're looking at now is Project Online. So we're looking at a number of different projects, and they're sort of grouped based on a particular project type. So we've got infrastructure and deployment, marketing campaigns. And then we're using various graphical indicators based on metrics in the projects to sort of display extra information about them. So this is sort of when you're getting up to the sort of program and portfolio level. You can see all of your sort of cost roll-ups. Uh, if you keep tracking benefits against these plans, you can see those rolled up as well. And I'll scroll down and see whether our new one has uh, arrived yet. So there it is at the bottom, uh, Tech Ed Strategic Business Generation. So we've now got that sort of new enterprise project brought into the system. So you can see as well here, there's two different types of icons if you've got very, uh, very good eyesight. There's one that just looks like a sort of a Gantt chart, and there's another one that looks like a sort of a, a stacked set of tasks. So the two different sorts we've got are SharePoint task list projects and enterprise projects. So an enterprise project is one that generally lives in Microsoft Project Professional, but you can also edit it in Project Online via the Project Web App. And I can show you that in a second. The SharePoint task list project are ones that you can open in Project Professional, but normally they live in SharePoint, and people will update them as task lists. And you'll see the difference if I click on, on one of these. So for instance, if, if I click on um, Management Offsite, it's a SharePoint task list project. So when I get to it, I just see tasks. I go back to my project center and click on uh, an enterprise project. Which one should we go for? Removable protective lining sounds um, a really interesting project. So if I click on that one, 
It's going to open it using the schedule web part and any other what are called project detail pages that relate to that particular project. So as part of the demand management in Project Online, you can have workflows built into the onboarding of projects. So if somebody has an idea for a project, there might be a whole sort of set of information you want to gather about that project before you decide whether you're going to implement it or not. So these project detail pages allow you to capture that information, run workflow, and eventually you'll get to a point where you've got a schedule. I'm going to jump straight to the schedule in this particular part. So again, this, this is on the web. You can edit the project there. Um, this one happens to be checked in, but if I check it out by going into edit, I can go in here and sort of change dates if I want to and sort of move that that generally about. But you can't do sort of leveling, um, baselining, all those kind of things from within the browser. So it's really sort of lightweight project management that you tend to do in here. If I wanted to do some heavy sort of changes in this plan, I'd probably open it with Project Professional. And you can open it from Project here as well. So if I close that off, check it in, One of the other options I could have taken is to open it with Project Professional. And you can do that directly from the Project Center by selecting a project. And then you can open in browser, in browser for editing, in Microsoft Project, or in Microsoft Project for editing as well. So different options that you've, you've got available to you there. Now, once your projects are, are enterprise projects, your tasks will be showing up in a, in a slightly different way, and you've got a lot more security around them for your um, resources to update those tasks. And they can either use the, the, the normal sort of tasks input, where they could say, okay, it's 50% complete. Uh, they might be putting in that they've got you know, three days is their estimate to complete. So you can, you can format the, the task input in different ways. Or you can take the input directly from a timesheet as well. And again, the timesheet can work in two different ways. One that most customers use is called tied mode, which ties in the timesheet to the task. So you don't have to do double entry. You just say, I did eight hours, and the eight hours goes into the project. You can keep them separate. And some customers sort of assume that the number of hours that somebody might spend and record in their timesheet doesn't necessarily equate to the same number of hours put into that task in terms of progress. So you know, they might have spent all day on it, but they think that four hours of that wasn't really working on the task as such. It was doing background research, which isn't something that the, perhaps if they're charging it onto a customer, they shouldn't be paying for. So you can have different numbers in the timesheet and the tasks field if you want to. Normally, they'd be the same. Most customers use tied mode, so they don't have to do the double entry on, on that one. The, the other thing you can do is convert a project from a SharePoint task list to an enterprise project. And if I go into my server settings here, I can look at all the connected SharePoint sites I've got. And most of them are enterprise projects, the active down the middle. And you can see that they've got enterprise project features. Um, some aren't. So the management offsite is not an enterprise project. But if I click Activate, it would actually turn it into an enterprise project. So if I now click on it, instead of going through to a task list in SharePoint, it will take me to that uh, schedule web part, or it tells me that it can only be edited in the schedule web part. So there's different ways of, of handling the projects depending on how you want your tasks to, how you want your users to interact with them. Now, a couple of points on the integration to SharePoint and the task list. If I come to, for instance, my, uh, so look, the one I just did, the TechEd Strategic Business Generation. So that's now an enterprise project that I would normally edit in Project Web App or Project Professional. If I go to the site itself, it still has the task list. OK, 
think I've possibly gone through all But normally, you, you wouldn't be able to edit the task list at, at this end. Once it's an enterprise project, then you would um, just see the task list in a read-only mode. I'll just go into a different one there. I think I've picked the wrong choice there. I'll just go back to my connected SharePoint sites. I'll go into the management off-site one, because that's the one that we were, we were just looking at. So the, the yellow banner at the top says, this project can only be edited through Project Web App. So if I click on there, it will take me across to PWA and the Project Web App and the Schedule Web Part. So I can no longer edit the task list, but it does show me the tasks in the SharePoint list. And that's very important. When you save uh, an enterprise project into Project Web App or into Project Online, at the same time that it saves that into our sort of project database structure, it's also pushing all the tasks for that project into the task list of the project site. So you may have people that just want to go to the site and they can read through the tasks. Uh, you may have people that want to go to the schedule web part and edit the tasks. So you've got the best of both worlds. Now the challenge comes, and this is something that uh, some of our customers are, have run into, if you have very large projects, and I don't mean huge, I mean, well, say if you've got a project that's over 5,000 rows, which is probably not ultra large, but it's pretty big, it's not really that practical to have those 5,000 rows as tasks in a task list in SharePoint. And beyond the practicalities, it could also hit the throttling settings that you've got within SharePoint as well. So it can cause problems when you're publishing large projects that it can't actually write to the, to the task list. Um, now, the issue that can give you, the, the task list is also used for linking issues and risks to tasks themselves. So you don't actually, if you create a, an issue or a risk, and there are features that are available uh, in the project site itself, so you can create those for any of the plans that you've got, you can link those to specific tasks. And when it actually does the linkage, it's not linking back to the line in your project plan as such in your MPP file. It's actually linking to the task in the SharePoint list. So if you like, it's a proxy for the task in the project plan itself. So if you have got large plans and you um, have to stop them writing out to the task list, then the issues and risks part gets broken as well. So it's just something you need to consider uh, in terms of the different ways of working with projects and SharePoint lists and so on. So that's all I had on the demo side. So just an, an overview of the demo. So obviously, Tasks are fairly easy to manage in SharePoint. Beyond Excel, they give you the ability to uh, assign them to people. People can actually go in and say, yep, I've completed these tasks. They can see them in different ways. I didn't show you, but one of the options from, an, from any SharePoint task list is to sync those to Outlook. So they could be responding to those tasks within the SharePoint lists just using Outlook or OWA or you know, some other uh, mobile device. They could be doing it on their iPad with, with Outlook running on the iPad. So there's lots of different ways for people to sort of interact and collaborate if you're just using SharePoint task lists. Obviously, you can then open those task lists in Project Pro for Office 365 and sort of treat it more like a, a full-blown project and do sort of more project management type things with it. Uh, we saw the new reporting features in Project. Very easy to then sort of take that information out of Project, put together monthly reports, whether it's the timeline or the burndown reports, some of the other things there. And then once you connect through to project online, project server, you can do a lot more sort of decision making uh, in terms of some of the reports on the server side, which I didn't show you today, but if you want to see the recording from yesterday, I showed some of them there. Um, you can then sort of see rolled up information uh, about all of the projects that are on your system. One other thing I'll mention here, I, I forgot to mention it earlier on, you saw the reports in the project client. Um, one thing that some people miss is that you can actually, if you're using Project Server or Project Online, you can open a number of different projects at the same time. So like making a temporary master project 
And you can then use the client side reports, which will report across all of those projects that you've opened. So another good feature of the, the client side reporting, grab a few projects from the server and look at the report information across all of those. So some resources on, on this sheet. Uh, most of the project product information is out at microsoft.com slash project. Uh, for Project Online, we do have some partner-led trials. So if you follow that link there, uh, that will take you to an opportunity to sign up for a trial for Project Online and work with a partner to get that, that working for you. Um, the next link there is for TechNet. So technet.microsoft.com slash project server. Lots of information both on the online and on-premises solution uh, and white papers up there as well. Uh, the link to MSDN. So msdn.microsoft.com slash project has links through to the SDK for 2013 and for 2010, as well as information on how the programmability against Project Online works in terms of CSOM and the, the, the REST APIs and so on. Uh, we've got an active set of forums out on social.technet.microsoft.com. Uh, the client one is listed there, which is category project. And that's any version. I think in some of the... Some of the forum names, it seems to say 2010 for some reason. I think we sort of moved off the old news groups into forums during the 2010 period, and that got into the names. But that is for questions on any of the clients, whether it's standard, professional, uh, 2010, 2013, or, or Project Pro for Office 365. Uh, the final link there, the support blog, uh, http colon whack whack technet.microsoft.com slash project support is our team blog. So we tend to sort of post on there any new information about service packs, um, cumulative updates that are coming out for project. We also put up there new features that are coming through as well. So if there's some, something new that's going to be added to project online, we try and give you a heads up that it's coming. Um, I know it can be very frustrating even on some of the social networks. You go into Facebook one day and it's all changed and it just sort of blows your mind and you don't like it and you shut it down again. Um, now, Project Online, we, we have the ability to do that. We try and use it wisely. We, do, we certainly don't want to make your, your life difficult, but we've had feedback from particularly enterprise customers that if they've got procedures that people are following to do things in a certain way and suddenly we change that way and it just appears one day, that's not good. Um, so through our different channels, probably the, the top link to the um, microsoft.com slash project or the bottom one to project support, we try and put that information out there with screenshots, you know, here's what's coming. And then the final thing, ask the experts. Um, you missed it, it was last night. Um, so if you have any questions that I don't manage to answer in the next 11 minutes and 38 seconds, um, then certainly contact me via my blog, uh, blogs.msdn.com slash Smith. There's a, a ton of project information on that blog as well. We tend to use the project support blog as the sort of primary posting place but I'll often do other postings on my blog as well or pointers across to other sort of interesting stuff in the project world. So at this point, I wanted to open it up for questions. So if you could use the microphone, please, then I'll be able to hear what you're asking and not answer the questions I'm making up myself. There is also an appendix in the slides um, when you get hold of those, which goes into some agile project management solutions. Uh, one of my colleagues put those together and it's sort of, wasn't going to cover it in the session, but it might be some useful slides there to, to take a look at. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the rest of TechEd and the party on Thursday. And any questions? If you're too embarrassed to ask the questions in public, I will be sort of hanging around for a, for a while, so do feel free to sort of come up and ask me on a one-to-one. -one. Thank you. Uh, whether that's Android, iPhone, or, or Windows phone, so that it can interact with projects. So you might be able to do your timesheet on an iPhone, for instance, and then the updates will go through to Project Server, Project Online, and then the project manager can sort of accept those in. But I mean, today there isn't a sort of replacement for Project Professional the sort of PC desktop. Um, and another point I just wanted to clarify here, uh, who's heard of Project Online? Just a quick. OK, so uh, quite a few of you heard of Project Online. Uh, I won't ask you what you think it is, because it might 
upset me to think that you think it's something that it isn't. The, the naming has confused quite a few people that they think, oh, I use Project, I use Microsoft Project. Here's an online version, I'll go and buy that. And then they get it and realize that it isn't actually Microsoft Project in an online form. It's really sort of Project Server served via uh, the cloud. So we perhaps should have called it Project Server Online, but then we don't call Exchange Online, Exchange Server Online. So the server bit got dropped, but it gets very confusing for Project because we've got a desktop application called Project. Obviously, for Exchange, there isn't a desktop application called Exchange. It's called Outlook, so there's no confusion there. Um, so I've seen quite a few people that sort of sign up for Project Online and think, mm, this isn't what I was expecting. So if you're sort of expecting the desktop version of Project, then Project Pro for Office 365 is, is that replacement. And there isn't a, a pure web form of Project um, Professional as such. You can do a lot of editing of projects in the browser. So if you're working on a, a reasonably small project and you're not having to do uh, sort of heavy things like sort of baselining, sort of portfolios of projects compared to sort of desktop, OK, that's good. That's good. Right. And what I'm going to be talking about today, well, firstly, I'll talk about the, the, the sessions. If, uh, how many were at yesterday's session that I did? OK, there's a few of you. There will be a, a little bit of repetition. But even the bits that are very similar to the things I did yesterday, I'm going to try and do them in a different way and show you some slightly different things. So hopefully, it should be sort of valuable for, for people who are at yesterday's session anyway. Not too much overlap. Um, so hopefully, the ones that weren't at yesterday's can watch the recording of that one. And then the, gen the agenda for today, I'm just going to talk briefly about the sort of uh, philosophy and vision for project, where we sort of see it going and sort of where it's coming from. Um, then there's going to be some demos and some demos and some more demos. And then at the end, there'll be time for Q&A. So hopefully we can leave questions to the end. If there are any that do crop up, if you could use the microphones, uh, it not only helps with the recording, because everybody can hear what you're saying on the recording, but my hearing's not as good as it was. And I sometimes get it, the, the sort of situation where I start answering the question that I'd like to answer rather than the one that you've asked if I don't hear it properly. So if you, if you use the microphones, you've got a better chance of getting your question answered rather than the one I want to answer. So that helps. Um, I shouldn't be doing too many slides. Most of this session will be in, in, uh, spent in demos. And just in case you want to sort of rush out and go to your second choice session, what I plan to sort of cover is talking about uh, SharePoint task lists. So it won't all be spent in Project Pro for Office 365. SharePoint task lists, what you can do with them, what you can't do with them, um, how you can get those into uh, Project Pen. So you know, potentially, um, Project Pro for Office 365 can help with the other stuff, uh, whether it makes, easy, makes it easier or not. Or, well, hopefully it makes it easier. It certainly doesn't make it easy. Um, I'll also mention here what is Microsoft Project Pro for Office 365, because it might be a term that uh, some of you haven't heard before. It's basically Microsoft Project Professional 2013, but just delivered via subscription model and automatically patched for you. So it will sort of receive updates. It'll be downloaded via click to run when you first sign up. Um, and it'll be updated as you go along, so you don't have to worry about it. But in terms of what it looks like, what it does, you wouldn't be able to spot the difference between that and Project Professional 2013 very easily unless you started sort of looking behind on the file menu and see how your updates are delivered and all that kind of thing. So it is basically the um, Project Professional 2013 delivered via subscription. It can be used just as you'd used Project Standard or Project Professional. You can just use it as a desktop tool. You don't have to be using it with Project Online. So you know, it, it may be a, an easier way for you to purchase Project Professional to get the Project Pro for Office 365 version rather than sort of getting the, the normal sort of, if you like, packaged software version to, to sort of put it a different way. Uh, a quick poll of who I've got in the room. Uh, I guess it, as we're at TechEd, most of you are sort of IT pro. Is that a fair assumption? No IT pros. That, that is a surprise. Um, so how many of you actually manage projects? How many would actually call yourself a project manager? OK, that's good. How many of you manage online, how you can open those task lists with Project Professional? Uh, some of the restrictions you might run into with running those as task lists? 
Uh, then sort of moving up to um, sort of more in-depth on Project Pro for Office 365, looking at some of the new features around uh, team planner, task paths, uh, a lot on the reporting, digging into some of those things, uh, the timeline, um, publishing those projects to Project Online, so um, making those sort of true enterprise projects rather than just sort of a, a local MPP or a, a SharePoint task list project. Um, and then sort of talking about the differences between all of those different aspects and where you might want to use one and where you might want to use another. Um, so hopefully that will give you a sort of good insight to what Project Pro for Office 365 is, both in terms of a standalone application, something that you might connect to SharePoint, something that you might connect to Project Online, and how that all sort of hangs together. So not too many people got up and ran away, so um, that, that's good, that's good. Hopefully you've come to the right room. So philosophy and vision um, for, for Microsoft Project, what we're looking at doing is delivering a comprehensive set of tools so that you can use sort of almost any device through the cloud or on premises. So today for Project, I and mean, we don't have the sort of native iPad app for Microsoft Project Professional. Um, you can actually run Project Professional in a lot of the emulation software that you might run on a, an Apple Mac, for instance. So we do sort of play in that environment. But we do support all the browsers. So if you're using a, um, any of the phones, the browsers on the phones will work. We've also got a good uh, partner ecosystem. And a lot of them have taken our APIs and then built applications to run on the various different phone systems. So I have the pleasure of, of getting you just after the lunch break. So thanks very much for, um, for choosing to come to this session. And I uh, hope I can, uh, I can wake you up after all that great food you've been, uh, been eating at lunchtime. But at least the lunch breaks are quite long. So chances are you ate sort of like 45 minutes ago, perhaps even an hour and a bit ago. So you've got sort of past that post-lunch uh, session and you'll be uh, ready for some action. And my name is Brian Smith. I'm an escalation engineer in the support team for Microsoft Project. I've been working in the support group for uh, probably coming up 10 years this year. So I worked on the uh, 2002, 2003, 2007, 2010, 2013, and Project Online releases. Uh, before joining the support group, I worked for a solution group. Uh, developing sort of small applications that, that ran on top of uh, Project Server. Uh, one of those was a, a Six Sigma accelerator for Project Server 2002, uh, and that was also revised for 2003. If you ever use those applications, um, you have my apologies. Um, they were great applications, but didn't sort of um, work too well when you patched the server and went up to SP1 and all those kind of things. So uh, that's a long way behind me now. Um, I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon about managing projects just got easier with Microsoft Project Pro for Office 365. As I mentioned, I'm a support guy and not a marketing guy. I probably wouldn't have said that managing projects can ever get easier. It's always hard work, and the tool is, I guess, the easy bit of it. The really hard bit with project management has nothing to do really with the technology and the applications and everything else. It's all the other stuff you have to do to make stuff happen.